morning, everybody. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord with you all. Let's rise up together and worship our Father, shall we? Sing with me. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I'll raise a hallelujah louder than Feed 
morning, everyone. I'm glad to see you here. I'm glad you weathered the storm of last week. I know we've had some challenges, haven't we? But the Lord is faithful to protect us, is he not? A couple, uh, couple of quick announcements here. Friday night, November 6th, 6.30, we're having a children's event. Unfortunately, we're not doing our fall festival as we normally do because of COVID, but on that Friday night, this coming Friday night, we're having a children's event at 6.30, dinner, a movie, and some activities. So if you have children anywhere between the ages of about two and, well, I was going to say 22, but no, we don't want them that old, to, <laughs> through school age, bring them in. We're going to have a great time. It'll be a time of fellowship, and the parents, once we get the kids going on their things, we'll slip off and have a cup of coffee and fellowship a little bit. Another quick announcement for you at home. Keep this in mind as well. We're supporting Fullerville Mission with their Thanksgiving outreach. And normally we, connect, we collect canned goods. This year they've asked us to collect two-liter drinks. Our goal is 100 two-liter bottles. So bring those in. Do me a favor. Have them double bagged and tie the handles together so they don't spill out of the bags. Put them in the fellowship hall, and we will be collecting those between now and Thanksgiving. One other quick thing because we're not having our Thanksgiving feast, I want to challenge us to help someone else. We are going to take a special collection to give to the Villarica Police Department because they are buying some protective gear. They're buying active shooter vest. It's a heavy-duty vest, heavier than the Kevlar. And we as a congregation want to help protect those who protect us. Amen? So just if you give an offering for that, mark it vest program and we'll make sure those funds are directed that way at the end of the month but let us pray father we thank you we thank you for your protection through this storm we've just been through lord and we thank you for your protection through all the storms of life father you have given us so much you gave your one and only son that we could be protected from the power of sin and death and that's why we gather together today and that's why we raise our voices and praise to you. And our God's people said, Amen. Amen. The king of 
wonderful and glorious and mighty. We just thank you and praise you that your presence is here with us this morning. We pray that this, uh, this offering of praise and worship is pleasing to your ears, O King of kings and Lord of lords. Praise you, Father.
worship you for who you are, how good and how mighty, how merciful and how gracious. We love you, Father. It's in your name we pray. Amen. before we go into communion time. Um, as you know, we're being very cautious because of the virus. And um, when we uh, do communion, we are using the portable communion cups that are in the table, on the table in the back. So um, if you're visiting with us this morning and you desire to partake of communion with us, uh, please uh, go ahead and grab a, uh, a portable uh, set. Um, secondly, we're not passing the plate anymore for offering, but the plates are in the back. You'll see them in the back of the sanctuary. So uh, for your offering, just uh, um, please uh, avail yourself of the plates in the back. And now as we go to communion, Jesus showed us and taught us what we must do at this time. And in Matthew chapter 26, we see the story of the Last Supper. And we won't look at the whole thing this morning, but we'll look at the key. We'll look at the heart. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And so that's what they did. They took the bread, they took the wine, they took it into themselves, and this was a form of remembrance. It's just what we do today. But there was a promise as well. That not only do we do this now, but he tells us that we will partake and we will eat of this again when we see him in the kingdom of heaven. What a great promise. He was about to go to the cross and he tells us he'll see us again, and he'll do this again with us in heaven. Let's remember him right now. Father God, we just thank you so much for this time in our service where we can come. And um, Father, you've given us the miracle of remembrance that even though we weren't there, even though we didn't see it, Father, we know that it's real and we know that it happened. And you've given us the ability to remember. And we pray this morning, Father, as we partake of these emblems and take them into our bodies that that we remember your son, that he did go to the cross, that he did willingly accept those nails, pour out his blood, and pour out his life on our behalf. And Father, as we do this, we remember the promise that we will do this once again with him in heaven. Thank you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name.
die to ransom the slave from every people and tribe every nation and tongue he has made us a kingdom and praise to God to reign with the sun is he worthy is he worthy of our blessing and honor and glory is he worthy is he worthy is he worthy chose us who chose us and loves us we thank you for this father we pray that our hearts and minds are open to the word this morning and it's your good name we pray amen man he is indeed worthy before i get started in the message today i want to challenge all the adults in the congregation. I want to ask you to, today is November 1st, and I want to ask you to do something for me for the next three months. I want to challenge you to open up your Bibles on a daily basis and read a chapter of Proverbs. Read it through November and December, and then in January I'm going to begin a series of messages coming out of Proverbs. So that will give you two months to, to read through it. And if you get behind, just go to the date on the calendar and pick up there. But that gives us two months to read ahead and think about what I'm going to be preaching about, and then I would encourage you to read through in January again. Proverbs is a book of wisdom, and I don't think we can read God's Word too often, and if we read Proverbs, we gain a lot of knowledge quickly because they're short little couplets generally that are just golden nuggets of God's wisdom for God's people. So go ahead and start that today. If, if you can't today, start tomorrow. A chapter a day. Just look at the calendar and match the chapter to the day on the calendar, read through November, December, and then in January, I'll come back with a series of messages. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I can only scratch the surface lightly in a, in a month-long series on Proverbs. We may stretch it out into February as well. We'll see how that goes. Uh, so please, be doing that for us. Today, we, we are, we're having a special day today. We're going to ordain two elders here in a little bit. And Tim, before I get started, when I hit the... Uh, when I, after I read the Titus passage on the second point, that's when you can go get the children. Our children are going to come up to be a part of this. Many of our older children especially wanted to see what goes on in the ordination of elders and deacons. And, and so we're going to bring them out and let them participate and see as well. A lot of what we do, a lot of what we teach as Christians is modeled, right? Modeling what we do is one of our most powerful testimonies. Not just for our children, but for our co-workers and those that we walk with and talk with every day. Amen? All right, today's sermon is titled, A Call to Serve. And the theme verse is 1 Timothy 3.1. Here's a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Today we gather to worship the Lord, and as we do most Sundays. But today we're going to set two of our own apart as elders. Two men that have shown by serving one another. Two men who have shown by serving Christ. Two men who have served here in this congregation in many ways for many years. Now, as I talk about elders, I want us to understand it's not just church leaders who are called and set apart. We're all set apart for a purpose. We're all called to serve. And so keep that in mind. I've spoken on Christian service a number of times, and it's almost in every sermon in some form or fashion. I've spoken on it since I've been here from the very beginning. I've spoken of three T's, our giving of our time then service, giving of our tithes, giving back some of our finances to advance God's kingdom, and giving of our talents, those natural abilities we have that can be ordained and given to the Lord to serve. 
And then again, those spiritual gifts that we receive from Him when we're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Today, we gather to worship, but today we also set two of our own apart. Before we look at the Scriptures, let me tell you that the Bible uses the word overseer and elder. Some translations use the word bishop. The Bible uses it almost interchangeably. So there'll be times you'll hear the word overseer instead of elder. But it is an office in the church, a position that one is set apart for. As I spoke with the elders of this church about the possibility of becoming pastor, I talked with them, and one thing I stressed with them was that I did not want to be a pastor that was a a one-man show. I've seen a lot of churches where the pastor is the ruler of the church and he does it all and what he says goes and and, and that's not a biblical model. In fact, when I came to the elders and they asked me if I would consider becoming pastor, I said, I will, but here's my philosophy and I'm jumping ahead here a little bit, but I spoke in the words of Peter and presented myself as an elder among elders. You see, in the Bible, elders is always a plurality. It's not an elder, it's a group of elders that come together to lead and to serve the church. And we currently have three elders, and then there's myself, and like I said, I I present myself as an elder among elders, and the elders said we would have it no other way. And they hold me accountable, and I hold them accountable. There are times they light a fire under me, and vice versa. And we spur one another on to acts of love and service. And that's what we expect of our new elders as well. We have a team of elders who are seeking God's will in their lives, in their families' lives, and in the life of the congregation that they will be serving. We're going to to look at quite a few passages today. And Peter is writing on the purpose of elders. In 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3, To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. Not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. I love that Peter's doing what Jesus did a lot. He used the example of a shepherd and a flock to express these ideas. The purpose of an elder is pretty clear if you get right down to it. Now, understand I said pretty clear, but not easy. There's a big difference. To understand and see what you're supposed to do is one thing, but doing it quite often is a challenge. Now, We have a congregation where I've not yet experienced any dissensions or any huge issues. But it will happen. Those that have been here long know there's been times in the past where it's happened, right? I see a few heads shaking. But that's just human nature when we gather together. But the elder is set aside to lead the flock. At times it brings great joy. At times it brings sleepless nights. But it always takes us to the throne of grace in prayer. The the job is simple. It's to shepherd the flock. It means to lead. The shepherd leads the flock. He guides the flock. Even when the sheep don't want to follow. No present company excluded, okay? I'm not... But but that's what an elder and a shepherd does. He guides the flock through good times and through challenging times. He feeds the flock. He looks after the flock. He visits when they're sick. He'll visit when they're not sick. He'll visit when they've been absent for a while. In times of COVID, it may not be a knock on the door. It might be a phone call or a text or a Facebook message. But the shepherd feeds the flock. And then he protects the flock. How does he do that? By teaching the truth. There's plenty of hollow philosophies and things that can lead us astray these days. Amen? And it seems like they're in our face all the time. They come electronically nowadays, and it shows up when you least expect it. If you haven't done a Google search lately, just get on there and try to find something and see all the other garbage that pops up in your spam. 
uh, all those ads. But he protects by teaching and exposing the lies of the devil. By making sure that he sticks to the word of God and that he leads the congregation in doing the same. Again, I'm not talking about issues I've seen here in this congregation, but it's just issues that generally we see within the world. The latter portion of this passage, verses 2 and 3, speaks of his motives. Let me read that again, starting at verse 2. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve and not lording it over them, over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. An elder leads by example. That's what we do. We model. Each Christian models, and elders are being held to a higher standard to model their faith, to share their faith, to model it in every aspect of their life. They're serving not under compulsion, let me tell you, an elder makes about three times as much as your average Sunday school teacher. Okay? All the Sunday school teachers are volunteers. That's what I'm getting at there. These are not paid positions, so nobody's doing this for a paycheck. And they're doing it for the honor and the glory of God. They serve out of a desire, a sincere desire to enrich the flock, not to fleece them, not to take advantage of them, not for their own gain. Much like a shepherd knows his sheep and the sheep know his voice, the elder knows the congregation. Now, it's hard for me to know everybody personally, and I do my best, but the elders know some of you better than I do. And that's what an elder is to do. Just like a sheep knows a shepherd's voice, the elders know the voice of the congregation. So now we've talked a little bit about what an elder does. How does a church choose their elders? Well, here at Villarica, the current elders pick elder candidates from amongst our congregation. And since I've been here, we've been talking about it and praying about it. And what we did was we looked at these men, and we looked at their walk, and we looked at their lives, and we looked at their families, and we talked to them, and we prayed with them, and we went to them and said, would you consider this? Don't tell me now. Don't give me an answer right now. Would you consider this? Pray about it and get back with me in a few days. And these men realize it's not something to be taken lightly. And they prayed about it. And with much discussion, they even talked with their, their families, which is a wise thing to do. They came back to me and were overjoyed to be asked and decided that they would serve. I'm going to look at the qualifications of elders here in just a second. Paul is uh, instructing Titus. Titus was someone who administered with Paul, and Titus was in Crete, and Paul was telling him how to select elders in this church and what to look for. Let's look at Titus 1, 6-9. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who approve it. I don't know about you, but that's a, I think that's a, quite a list. Could you imagine if every job we might pursue in our life had a list like this? I imagine we'd all be lined up at the unemployment office, wouldn't we? And we aren't saying these men are blameless, holy, or perfect, but we do believe that these men are pursuing the Lord Jesus Christ with all that they have and all that they are. And we can find no wrongdoing in them, no blatant wrongdoing. Now, if I were to call these men up here now, they would probably tell you, I don't measure up to this list. But we have examined them in a lot of ways. We've talked with them, we have witnessed them, we have served with them, and we believe they do stand up under the scrutiny. Perfection? No. 
none of us will be perfected until the day we open our eyes before the Lord Jesus Christ. But these men are striving and growing and serving. It tells us what an elder is to be and what he's not to be. There's a list of desirable traits and a laundry list of undesirable ones. Blameless is mentioned twice. No one's perfect, but these men strive to walk in the presence of Christ regularly. There's a list of the nots, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not given to dishonest gain. That's quite a list. And I'll tell you, these men don't have any of these qualities that I've seen. But I can tell you, I know some folks in the world that would, would, would fit this description right here. It needs to be hospitable. I have sat and broken bread with these men in their homes. I've, I've talked with them more than, more than once, on many occasions. They love good. They're self-controlled. That's, that's really one of the first things that I've noticed. Their character, the way they carry themselves. Not loud and boisterous, but disciplined and self-controlled. Upright, holy, and disciplined. It's quite a list. And why is that so important? Because elders are to manage and to lead God's, God's house and His people. If we look to the Old Testament, and this is not going to be in the, the outline, but if we look to the Old Testament, Eli had two sons who were priests, and, and they were not these things. In fact, they were taking advantage of the people. They were taking more than their share of what was set aside as an offering. Part of the offering was to support the priest, but they were taking way more than their share. They were even known to be hotheads and threatening people physically and had morals that were very questionable. And as a result, they were struck down by God and Eli was reprimanded for not correcting his sons. In these men that we are putting forth today, that we're going to lay hands on and ordain, we see the God's Spirit at work in them through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to move forward to 1 Timothy. And Tim, you may want to go ahead and go get the children because it may take a minute to bring them up. We know how that is, right? Getting a group of children to move in the same direction at the same time for the same purpose. That can be a challenge. 1 Timothy 3.1, uh, we're going to look through verse 7. Here's a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife. Temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must, be a recent, he must not be a recent convert. Or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Now this list has got a lot of the same elements as the first list, but they're not identical. Paul's expanding upon it. He adds hospitable, able to teach, gentle, grounded in faith, not a recent convert. Both of these men are well-grounded in their faith. They're hospitable. I've been in their homes. Great guys all the way around. Gentle spirits. Humble spirits. With these qualifications, the elders, again, they lead the flock. They lead in a number of ways. They lead by teaching and protecting, and they lead by modeling. They help... Uh, they help in so many ways. They help by looking out for the structure, the building itself. They help by looking after the grounds. They help with the finances. They will help with so many different aspects of what it takes to run a church. But it's not just about what we do here on this piece of property either. I have no doubts that these men will continue to glorify God when they're out doing their things with their families, when they're working somewhere, when they're traveling. They will be a good witness for this church 
and for the Lord Jesus Christ. They feed the flock by preaching, teaching, and modeling the words as they go about their everyday lives, and they protect the flock from false teachers and those who might lead us astray. And as I said, they'll help hold me accountable, and I will help hold them accountable to these things as well. Now, if I left you with just these passages, I'd be guilty of only showing you a part of what an elder is to be, what he does and what the qualifications are. We're going to, to look at Acts 20, starting at verse 28. And Paul, let me just give you some background. Paul is writing to a church. There's, there's some issues there, but Paul is really saying his final farewell as he knows he's heading, heading for persecution and possibly death. And he is telling the elders there to watch out. He's charging them. This is a charge to the elders. He says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. See, Paul's charging them to care for the flock, to lead the flock and feed the flock. He's aware that there's persecution breaking out in their community and in their area, in the entire region, frankly. And in verse 29, he says this, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after themselves. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all of those who are sanctified. You see, sometimes elders face tough situations. Sometimes elders have to deal with tough issues. If If and when dissension in a church breaks out, the elders wade right into the middle of it, hoping to bring peace and unity with God's Word. Elders encourage, but there are times they must also rebuke. Being an elder is not a position to be taken lightly, but with much prayer and consideration. Again, the elder's job is to lead the flock, to feed the flock, and to protect the flock. At this time, if I could have our elders' candidates come forward, and your wives, if you would come forward, the elders of the church and our deacons can go ahead and begin to come up too, if you would. Oh, kids, y'all can come sit up in the front row. That's That's good. Let me move this back a bit. There we go. These two men really need no introduction because you know them. They've walked among among us for We have Jimmy White and Buddy Shaw and Jimmy's wife Trina and then Buddy's wife Frankie. And we're going to take a moment. In the Bible we see that elders and deacons and those church leaders are set aside by a laying on of hands by the elders and the deacons who are already presently in those offices. At this time, I'd also like to ask anybody who is here today that would like to come up behind us and also lay a hand on our shoulders to come forward. prayer and set these two men apart for purpose, which I believe God called them to before he laid the foundations of this earth. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for my brothers here. Thank you for Jimmy and for Buddy. Thank you for their spouses, for Trina and for Frankie, Lord. Father, they have come to mean so much to us here at Villarica Christian Church and Lord, today we we recognize the call that you have placed upon their lives. And Father, we give thanks that they have accepted this call. Lord, I pray that as we serve together, as we continue to serve together for many, many years to come, Lord, I pray that you continue to 
Give us the wisdom that we would need in all things, Lord. Give them the wisdom and the patience and the understanding. Lord, help them to see beyond, beyond the physical, but help them to see your heart. May they be seeking your spirit continually, Lord. May you continue to guide them and fill them with your spirit and all that they should do. Lord, we thank you that they are willing to serve, and we just ask your guidance upon them in this role. Father in heaven, we just, uh, we just come before you today thankful for these men, thankful for their wives, and thankful for their families. And, and just now, Father, for these two men, Buddy and Jimmy, we just lift them up to you, Father. And we just pray that you would pour out your grace and your wisdom upon them, that in all things and in all ways, Father, that they might be the best servants to you that they can be we would love them and support them and that father we just simply ask your blessing upon them we ask it in Jesus name Lord we just thank you today for Jimmy and Buddy and lift them up Lord and lift them up to their families and soothe them and speak through them and give their witness to you Lord and just thank you for them willing to serve Lord we also Just thank you for this time of service and just a happy, glorious day, Lord, that you have just such a thing for us, Lord. And just be with us and just know that you're with us. Lord, we just ask you in these trying times that you give Jimmy and Buddy the wisdom and guidance to support David and the church and to guide us through this, these times. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we surround these two men and their families, Lord. Help us to, to lift them up. Help us to support them. Lord, I just pray that you would continue to give them the wisdom of Solomon, the patience of Job. But most of all, Lord, I pray that you would give them the power of the Holy Spirit to carry out the duties of the role that you have called them to, Father. We know that you are faithful. And for that, we give you all the honor and the glory and the praise. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Guys, if I could help you up here. Uh, if I could have the congregation have a seat, if y'all would stay here for just one second. I have a little something I want to present both of these men that is very symbolic of what of what a elder is called for and what this is is a a towel elders are called to serve the congregation so Jimmy buddy I look forward to serving with you brother I love you Y'all are near and dear to our heart. Also, I will go ahead and give you an ordination certificate. Now, before you leave with those towels, I have some washing instructions for you. Don't, don't, don't get it wet until I give it to you. That's rather ironic. There's special instructions not to get this towel wet before you wash it properly. But anyway, if y'all want to have a seat, uh, thank you. As I started out saying, this is a call to serve, not just as elders. And we as the church, we and the sitting elders and our new elders will soon be caught up to speed on this. We are making plans to begin to open up all of our regu regular programming. Our goal right now is we're looking toward the middle of January to open back up with our children's Sunday school and our Wednesday night program. And I'll be honest with you, we're looking toward the middle of January because that will give us time to get past Thanksgiving and Christmas. And let's face it, we're going to visit with family. And we want to be cautious in case anyone is exposed to COVID. We want to be cautious, but we're not going to be fearful. 
And that will give us a period of time to make sure we get back home and nobody brings anything back with them. And with that said, we need folks that are willing to get on board with teaching children Sunday school, adult Sunday school. We need hands on Wednesday night working with the children. We have our Wednesday night Bible study, which is already meeting. And so we need to open up the Wednesday night programs. And we want to get back to doing more of what we normally do. But we can't do that with just elders and deacons and myself. We're all called to serve. We're called to serve in so many ways, whether it be uh, giving a glass of cold water to someone in need, whether it be working on a building or it be teaching a group of three or four-year-olds, I know that scares some of you to death, right? But we have trained people that will teach you and lead you. I started as a youth minister. I didn't like teenagers. I know what they were like. I was one at one time. 21 years in middle schools and high schools working with teenagers. Some of those now are young adults and have their own families. I've been able to uh, officiate at wedding. So there's there are some blessings that come along with serving. I'm sure Miss Lee and Miss Courtney would tell you that, right? And our little ones are sitting up here being great. Way to go, guys. And we're glad to have you in here for this morning. It's been said that Christianity is one generation away from extinction. It's a call for everyone within the church to serve in some way, to teach these next generation about what Christ has done for us. Amen? So I'm going to be calling on some of you, and I'm going to be asking for commitments. And if Miss Courtney or Miss Lee calls you, we're not asking, oh, yeah, I'll do it sometime. No, we're asking for a commitment. Tell us what you can do, and if you're not sure, tell us what you need where we can help set you up, where you will succeed in sharing the ministry of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So we're going to be in touch with you. We're going to be calling the elders the deacons, like I said, it's a call for each one of us to serve in some way, to serve the one who gave himself for us. And those at home, I know right now that maybe you're not comfortable coming in person, and we understand, but let us know how we can serve you. And then again, there are ways you can serve from home. We have the two-liter drink thing with uh, Fullerville. Call me, I'll come by and pick them up. We're going to serve the Villarica Police Department. If you want to mail that check in, mail it in. If you want me to come pick it up, call me. I'll come by. We're here to serve to the glory and honor of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you that we can celebrate these two men who are answering the call to serve. And Lord, may we our new elders and our existing elders and myself as a pastor, Lord, may we never rest on our laurels. May we continue to seek after you with all of our heart, with all of our strength, with all of our being. Lord, may we set the example for the congregation. And Lord, as I look across this congregation, I know that there are those here today who hold no title, but yet they inspire me with their faith. They inspire me through their service. They inspire me through their love of you. Lord, may we continue to serve you so that your name will be lifted up and glorified throughout all of creation. May we continue to reach out to those who don't know you with love and the word of hope. Love has a name and it is Jesus Christ. And our hope is to be in eternity with you forever. May we be found faithful upon that day. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
serve your body, um, their brothers and sisters. Lord, we just ask a blessing and protection upon them. We thank you, Father. We thank you and we celebrate you. We pray that you are with us throughout the rest of our week. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. You're all dismissed. Yeah.